I know you. You're trying to get good at computer science so you can become a highly paid software engineer. But you're stuck in this frustrating cycle. You spend hours grinding through leak code problems, watching YouTube tutorials on repeat, and cramming before exams. Yet you feel like everyone else has some secret playbook that you don't. You scroll through Reddit and see people casually dropping comments like, oh yeah, just knocked out three leak code hard problems this morning, while you're still Googling how does depth first search actually work for the 15th time. But here's what nobody tells you. Those people aren't naturally smarter than you. They just stumbled onto a few key principles that completely changed the game and made computer science easy. My name is Amon, and back in college while doing my computer science degree, I cracked the code on this. I went from barely passing my classes to landing six software engineering internships at companies like Amazon, Shopify, and HP. And more importantly, I made computer science feel less like torture and more like something I actually enjoyed and was good at. In this video, I'm going to show you the exact four principles that transformed everything for me. These aren't just study tips, they're the cheat codes that'll make computer science not just doable, but actually easy. And if you stick around to the end, I'll show you how to get all of my templates and systems for free. Let's get into it. So the first system to get good at computer science that changed everything for me is to master what I call the Feynman method for programmers. Now, you're probably thinking, I'm on note taking? Really? I've heard that before. But here's the thing. 99% of students are doing note taking completely wrong and it's actually making them dumber. Let me tell you about my friend Jake from college. Jake was that guy who would show up to every data structures lecture with his laptop, furiously typing away, capturing every single word the professor said. His notes looked like the transcript of a court hearing. Absolutely perfect word for word accuracy. Jake failed a midterm. Meanwhile, I'm sitting next to him with half a page of scribbled notes and I aced it. What was the difference? Jake was a human copy machine. I was a human processor. Here's what most people don't understand. Your brain isn't a hard drive. You can't just download information and expect it to stick. Your brain is more like a muscle. It needs to be challenged, stretched, and worked out to get stronger. Richard Feynman, the brilliant physicist, figured this out decades ago. He said, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. This is what I call the Feynman method for programmers, and it's going to transform the way you learn computer science. Let's walk through a two-phase system that you can use to actually implement this method. Phase one is reconnaissance. That's before your lecture. The night before any computer science lecture, I would become a detective. I'd crack open the textbook, scan through the lecture slides, and start building what I call my intelligence report. But here's a crucial part. I wasn't just copying down definitions like a robot. When I encountered a new concept, let's say hash tables, I wouldn't just write down a hash table is a data structure that implements an associative array abstract data type. That's textbook garbage that'll be forgotten in less than 24 hours. Instead, I'd wrestle with it. I would write, hash tables are like having a really smart filing cabinet. Instead of searching through every folder to find what you need, you have a magical system that tells you exactly which drawer to open. Then I draw my own example, maybe using student ID numbers and lockers. The magic happens when you force your brain to translate abstract concepts into your own language. You're not just storing information, you're building neural pathways. Phase two was called intelligence gathering. That was during lecture. Now, when I walked into that lecture hall, I wasn't just there to be a passive transcriber. I was there as an active intelligence gatherer. My preliminary notes were already open and I was hunting for three things. One, gaps in my understanding that the professor could fill. Two, real world examples that made concepts click. And three, edge cases that textbooks never mention. The professor might say something like, hash collisions become a real problem when their load factor exceeds 0.75. Boom, that's going straight into my notes. Because that's the kind of practical knowledge that separates the pro students from the amateurs. Now, what tool did I actually use to do all of this? This is where Notion becomes your secret weapon. Now, most people think Notion is just a fancy note-taking app, but for computer science students, it's like having a Swiss army knife for your brain. Here's how I use Notion to build my computer science command center. First, I started by building a dynamic knowledge base. Every algorithm, every data structure, every concept got its own page with my explanations, examples, and edge cases. Next, Notion allowed me to cross-reference concepts. I could link related ideas instantly, go from binary trees and jump to tree traversal with one click. And finally, I had search superpowers. When I would eventually study for finals, I could just search time complexity and instantly find every note I'd ever taken on the topic. 
The result? By the end of the semester, I had this beautiful interconnected web of knowledge that made studying feel like browsing Wikipedia. Except everything was written in my own words and tailored to my understanding. And because I know setting this up from scratch is a pain, I'm giving you all of my Notion notes for free. I'm talking my complete computer science note-taking system, my project trackers, and my interview prep materials, everything. You can get them all at amamanazar.com slash Notion or hit the link below. This is a system that'll make you organize like a 10x engineer from day one. But mastering note-taking is just the beginning. What separates the good students from the great ones is something I discovered during my hardest semester. The second principle is what I call the 120% principle. And it's the difference between struggling through exams and absolutely dominating them. Let me paint you a picture. It's senior year, operating systems class, and we just had our first midterm. The average score, 67%. Students are walking out of that exam room looking like they just survived Hurricane Katrina. But there's this one guy, David, who's walking out with a smile on his face. Not the kind of smile you give when you barely scrape by. The confident smile of someone who knew every single question without a second thought. What was David's secret? While everyone else was studying to 80%, David was studying to 120%. Here's what I mean. Most students learn just enough to recognize concepts when they see them. They can look at a binary search tree and say, oh yeah, that's a BST. But when the exam throws them a curveball, like asking them to implement a BST deletion with all three cases, they freeze up. David didn't just learn what a binary search tree was, he understood the three deletion cases, so no children, one child, and two children, why in-order traversal gives you sorted elements, and when binary search trees degenerate into linked lists and how to prevent it. Also, the exact time complexity trade-off in different scenarios. David left no stone unturned. That's a 120% principle in action. So how do you actually implement this? You have to be brutally honest with yourself about what you actually understand versus what you think you understand. To do this, I developed what I call the five-year-old test. For every concept I learned, I would ask myself, could I explain this to a five-year-old in a way that makes sense? And if the answer was no, I wasn't done learning. Take recursion, for example. Most students learn recursion is when a function calls itself. That's textbook knowledge. But do you really understand recursion if you can't explain why the factorial function needs a base case or why infinite recursion crashes the program? The 120% student would understand recursion like this. Recursion is like Russian nesting dolls. Each doll contains a smaller version of itself until you get to that tiniest doll that can't be opened anymore. In code, each function call creates a smaller version of the same problem until you reach a case so simple it doesn't need to call itself anymore. That's the difference between 80% knowledge and 120% knowledge. Now, this connects to another concept I call the infinite evolution mindset. Most people think intelligence is fixed. You're either good at computer science or you're not. But I believe in infinite evolution. The idea that every skill is learnable, every ability can be developed, and with enough deliberate practice, you can surpass almost anyone at anything. So when I see someone crushing lead code hards while I'm struggling with easies, I don't think, man, I wish I was that naturally gifted. I think, what are the three specific things they're doing that I'm not? How can I reverse engineer their process and make it my own? This mindset shift changed everything for me. I went from being an average student to landing six software engineer internships because I stopped making excuses and started getting obsessed with understanding how success actually works. But understanding concepts deeply is only half the battle. The other half is something most computer science students completely ignore. The third principle is to assemble your council of Elrond. And this might be the most underrated strategy in all of computer science education. Here's a story that'll blow your mind. Junior year, I'm taking this brutal algorithms class, the kind where the professor starts every lecture with, this should be a review from data structures, but nobody actually remembers the concept from data structures. I'm struggling. My study sessions are turning into four hour death marches where I stare at the same problem until my eyes bleed getting nowhere. I'm basically Frodo trying to destroy the one ring, aka dynamic programming, all by myself. Then I meet Ben and Chris. Ben's this quiet genius who sees patterns and algorithms from miles away, and Chris is a guy who can explain any concept using analogies that somehow make perfect sense. He's basically the Gandalf of our group, turning complex algorithms into wisdom you can actually remember. We decided to form a study group. Within two weeks, my understanding of algorithms exploded. Here's what happened. Ben would break down the mathematical intuition behind an algorithm with elf-like precision, and Chris would translate it into memorable stories with Gandalf-level wisdom. 
and I would come up with edge cases and real world applications, bringing the practical human perspective. Just like the Council of Elrond, we each brought different strengths to tackle an impossible quest. Now, your Council of Elrond isn't just another study group, it's a fellowship united by a common mission. Each member brings their unique skills and perspectives to the table. Think about it. When the Council of Elrond in Lord of the Rings faced the problem of destroying the One Ring, they didn't just throw Frodo at it solo. They had Gandalf, the wise mentor who saw the bigger picture, Legolas, the sharp-eyed elf who spots details other myths, Gimli, the practical dwarf who knows what actually works, and Aragorn, the leader who connects theory to real-world application. In your study group, when you're stuck on understanding why Quicksort has an O of N squared worst-case complexity, your Legolas might spot the mathematical pattern, your Gandalf might explain the deeper principles, and your Gimli might show you exactly how to implement it. Together, you cover all the bases that would take you years to master alone. But here's the secret sauce. Teaching is like being Gandalf. You only understand something when you can guide others through it. When you try to explain dynamic program to your fellowship and you start stumbling over the overlapping sub-problems concept, you immediately know where your knowledge has gaps. Now, here's a modern twist I wish I had back in college. Use AI as your palantir, a seeing stone that reveals hidden knowledge. Upload your notes, lecture slides, and problem sets into ChatGPT or Claude, and have it challenge your fellowship. A great prompt is generate 10 challenging questions about graph traversal algorithms based on these materials. And boom, you've got a personalized quest tailored to what you just learned. The AI can even play the role of the Eye of Sauron, but in a good way. You say DFS uses O of H space, where H is the height of the tree, but what happens in the worst case scenario? These are the kinds of probing challenges that push your understanding to that 120% level. And finally, here's something most students don't realize. Your study fellowship is training for your real-world quest ahead. As a professional software engineer, you'll be doing code reviews, pair programming, whiteboard sessions, and architecture discussions. The student who learns how to collaborate effectively in their Council of Elrond, who can explain their reasoning clearly and ask intelligent questions, isn't just getting better grades. They're preparing for those epic quests in their software engineering career. But even with the best study group in the world, there's still one more secret weapon that most students never discover. The fourth and final principle is to unlock the professor's cheat codes. And this isn't about brown nosing or asking basic questions during office hours. Let me tell you about Professor Chen, my computer networks instructor. This guy was brilliant, but intimidating. His office hours were always empty because students were scared to approach him with dumb questions. But I had a different strategy. Instead of showing up with basic questions I could Google, I would do my homework first. I'd read the textbook, watch YouTube videos, work through problem sets, everything. I'd get myself to about 95% understanding. And then I'd show up with a 5% that was driving me crazy. Professor Chen, I understand how TCP's three-way handshake establishes a connection, but what happens if the final ACK packet gets dropped? Does the server think the connection is established while the client thinks it failed? His eyes would light up. These weren't textbook questions. These were the edge cases, those real-world scenarios that separated good engineers from the great ones. Now, here's my strategic office hours framework that you can use to do this exact same thing. Number one, you have to do the heavy lifting first. Read, research, and struggle with the material on your own. Then identify the 5% gap. Find the specific nuanced questions that quality sources can't answer. Number three is to bring concrete examples, like I tried implementing X, but got stuck when Y happened. And finally, you can ask about applications. Where would I actually use this in industry? Those professors who seem the most intimidating in lecture become your biggest advocates when you show up prepared with intelligent questions. See, Professor Chen started referring me to research opportunities. He connected me with a graduate student who helped me land my Amazon internship all because I approached office hours strategically instead of using them as a crutch. Now, here's a beautiful thing about this approach. It creates a compound effect. The more you engage with professors as intellectual equals rather than passive students, the more they start treating you like a future colleague. They'll share industry insights that never make it into lectures. They'll point you towards cutting edge research and they'll connect you with alumni working at companies you want to join. You're not just getting answers to your questions, you're building relationships that'll accelerate your career for years to come. Now, if you're sitting there and thinking, okay, I'm on, this all sounds amazing, but my real goal is landing a software engineering job. Well, you're not alone. Like 90% of computer science students, that's exactly why you're here. And that's exactly where my software engineering accelerator program comes in. This isn't just theory. We're literally going to take you step by step by step, get you that first internship or full-time offer, and show you how to balance it with everything else you've got going on in life. No fluff, no waste of time, just the exact playbook I wish I had when I was in your shoes. So if you want to make computer science easy and land the internship or new grad job of your dreams, check out the top link in the description. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.